Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to I'm going to I'm going to share a video with you and how and, and begin to start to break down the video with regards to uh, uh, identifying the muscles of the hip and knee and how they perform flexion and extension motions of the hip and knee. So here's the video to start and then we'll go into the slideshow and, and break it down. Okay, so here's the breaking down. Here are some, uh, some uh, screenshots, some clips, or some images of, of the breakdown of the, the motion. Okay, so what we just saw. So let's try it again. So we're just taking it through a little slower now. So what we're going to do is we're going to take it piece by piece. I'm going to go over the angles. I'm going to go over the degrees, the muscles that create these particular motions, starting from this picture right here, okay? Okay. So starting with this first part of her strike. So when we speak about either one side or two sides, one side or two sides, two sides is considered bilateral. Okay, it's considered bilateral. So, which means it's both sides. Um, one side is considered unilateral. Okay, so we're gonna just break down the unilateral right side of this athlete's uh, mechanics. So, starting with the hip and the knee. So, the hip is currently in extension. Um, and then the knee is also in extension. If we go back to the definitions of flexion and extension, we say flexion is a decrease in angle at a joint and extension is an increase in angle at a joint. So the more the joint decreases at the angle, the angle of joint decreases, the more flexion is, the more flexion is occurring. Uh, the more the joint continues to increase at an angle, the more extension is occurring. So the more flexion occurs as the angle decreases and it closes and the extension, more extension occurs as the angle increases or opens up. So let's go to the second uh, phase or second image. So right now she's at a, you know, again, unilaterally right her hip is in extension, and now her knee has moved into flexion. Okay, it was, a, it was in extension initially, and now it's moved into flexion in order to cock the leg back to allow her to generate power in order to strike the ball. The hamstrings, the insertion is now closer to the origin. So we go back to the insertion point of the hamstrings. It's either the, it's either the fibula for the biceps muscle or the long head and the short head, or on the medial side, it's either the, the tibia, the medial condyle, the tibia, or if we remember the um, pezan serine, right, the medial surface of the tibia for the semi tendinosis and semi membranosis. So either one of those muscles, right, or both of them actually, all three of them, are now considered to be closer 
to the origin, which the origin is the initial tuberosity, compared to before in the previous page, which we'll break that down as well, just a general introduction. The quadricep insertion is now further from the origin. So we go, the quadriceps, quadriceps insertion obviously is a tibial tuberosity. That tibial tuberosity is now further away from the origin, which is in the pelvis area, right? The anterior superior iliac spine, um, and then other associated uh, bony landmarks that allow uh, the quadricep to be something, a muscle that crosses two joints. So the, quad, in, the quadricep origin, and now the insertion is very much further down compared to uh, where it was before because the leg is now, uh, the hamstring is now created flexion of the knee more so than before. So we'll break that down on the next slide as well. So here we have a comparison of both the very first image, which is on, on the left, and the second image, which is on the right, which is the second phase or the second image of the sequence of images from the video. So the comparison for both, right, hamstring and quadricep. So the hamstring we outlined obviously in, uh, in a neon purple, as well as the green is kind of in a neon green. So the hamstring, if we go to the left side, the, the first image, right, or the left column, under comparison, it says hamstring is shorter length in image two. So it's a shorter length in image two. And if you go to do an eyeball test between image one and image two, image one, the line is actually longer. And what I've done is I've now there's, it's not exact, right? So what I've done is I've said, okay, look, we're going to put the, the most proximal end of the, or one of the ends of the neon purple line, we're going to put it right above the numbers, right? So it, for my eyeball test, it looks to be pretty close. And then the insertion point, we're going to put the insertion point of the hamstrings right along where the fibular head should be because that is where, where the long head of the biceps inserts. So if you look and you eyeball test the neon purple line, you can see that the neon purple line in image two is shorter than the neon purple line on image one. Now, when a muscle, and we haven't covered this yet, but we will, this is an intro to it. When the muscle shortens, it contracts. So it shortens, it contracts, it pulls, right? So it's gonna pull up on whatever possible attachment it's pulled up on. So we go back to the um, lower leg, right? We said the tibialis anterior, it, it actually inserts onto the base of the first metatarsal and the first cuneiform, right? And so when it attaches there, and if we, we did the pull lab, the laboratory with the muscles, and you pull up on that, that's going to dorsiflex the foot. So it's, it's a pull. It's a contraction. It's going to pull that particular um, muscle into the direction that it wants to pull it toward the origin. So if we go back to... Uh, the er eversion, right, where we're talking about the peroneal muscles. Um, the peroneal muscles were uh, lateral surface of the fibula, both superior and, and, and inferior portions, superior two-third, inferior two-third, attached to the fifth metatarsal and the first cuneiform for uh, first metatarsal uh, plantar surface. When it pulls, it's going to, when it contracts, it's going to evert the foot. So it's going to pull it toward the muscle. And so what I'm trying, obviously giving you some, some info on is that it's no different than, uh, it's no different for these muscles than it is for any other muscles that we've already covered. So when we're talking about this, this idea of pull and we look at the image on the left and the image on the right, that muscle has actually pulled that insertion point toward it. So now the muscle is actually shorter because the insertion point has is closer to the origin so the hamstring on the left shorter length in image two because of the pull it's contracted the quadricep is longer length in image two so uh, you can kind of eyeball a little bit you if you look it's like uh, you can kind of see that there is a difference in length slight difference in length compared to image one and again we try to uh, uh, pro, um, we try, I tried to attach the insertion origin exactly where it should be uh, on each muscle compared to each picture. So if you eyeball it, yeah, 
the right looks longer. So why is that? Well, obviously if the hamstring is shortening the muscle, then the quadricep has to lengthen. It has to lengthen and it basically has to stretch, right? So the quadricep must stretch to allow the hamstring to perform its motion. The hamstring is the prime mover here. It's the muscle that is moving that foot in the, the knee into flexion and the hip into extension in order to get the leg to cock back in order to allow there to uh, be enough power to strike the ball effectively. To go along with that, the quadricep, the quadricep must stretch or must lengthen in order to allow the hamstrings to fully effectively perform its action and perform its job. If it doesn't stretch and it, there is some limitation, right? If the, hand, if the quadricep in the antagonistic form, remember agonist is prime mover, antagonist is opposing movement uh, or an opposing mover, that quadricep must be able to stretch effectively in order for the hamstring to perform its motion of flexion at the knee. If it doesn't, right, if it doesn't, then the hamstring is going to have to perform more work. The hamstring is going to work harder because it has to basically counteract the resistance that the quadricep is, is forming, is, is, is posing to the hamstring. So they do fight against each other, right? They, they really do. They're, we're, we're, we, we hope from an injury prevention standpoint and even an injury rehabilitative standpoint in the field of sports medicine, we hope that those muscles are balanced enough to where there isn't enough, there wasn't a lot of fight. So we want to be able to uh, perform proper stretching. We want to be able to perform, to teach the athlete and, and provide the athlete with enough information and even perform that, uh, those particular tasks in order to allow the athlete to not have muscles and not have to fight each other. But most often with at least not necessarily the elite elite, but a lot of times, most often with high school athletes and even, even college athletes um, and even the other amateur levels and even the pros, right? They have enough fight in those muscles where eventually something fails. So if the quadriceps not flexible enough and the hamstring has to keep fighting, has to keep fighting, has to keep working, has to keep working, eventually what will happen is that hamstring will fatigue out. As we said, we talked about before with strains and so forth, it'll fatigue out and then it'll eventually fail. Um, and so to give you an idea, these muscles, they have to be able to be in sync with one another. So that hamstring has to be able to work. If it's going to work, the quadricep has to allow it to work. So the uh, going with the stretch, um, I created an image and a slide for you to see exactly what the technique of uh, or the motion looks like in an athlete who is performing their uh, quadricep flexion and hamstring, or I'm sorry, hamstring flexion and quadricep extension, or, or I should say um, knee flexion and hip extension actively, right, where they're doing it themselves in a, in a sport compared to how somebody is being stretched in the exact same motion. So this picture to the right where the individual is stretching the person is considered passive range of motion not something that's been covered yet but we'll get into it so a passive range of motion is when the individual is it's being passively done so they are passive in the in the motion someone else is doing it for them the active range of motion is when we're actively doing it ourselves like pictures to the left so what i've done is i've placed on the left the athlete performing the motion. Then what I've done is I've just kind of rotated or spun it a little bit so that you can kind of see is if she was lying down on her stomach, similar to the picture on the right where she's being lying on her stomach stretching, it would look very similar, right? So there's no difference in motion in terms of uh, in terms of whether it's being done in a, in a setting where they're working in a, in a, on a, in a, competition or a game, whatever it might be, or whether they're in a clinical setting or in a classroom setting being stretched or learning how to stretch, et cetera. So it's very, very similar. In fact, it's the same thing. Um, so the quadricep is being stretched, right? It has to be stretched. So here is uh, the image to the right is a little bit different in that the individual being stretched, her knee is in much more flexion 
than the athlete who is working on striking the ball. The knee is in much more flexion. The heel, uh, uh, the calcaneal area of the, athlete, of the person being stretched is much, much closer to the gluteal area or to her own gluteal area compared to the athlete. The athlete, actually his foot, is not even close to the gluteal area. But I wanted to give you a, a visual in terms of what the hip looks like because the hip is very, very similar, right? We have this, if we can see, we have this uh, gradual slope, right? Or this angle here. If we were to draw a line and then draw another line, it would be very similar angle compared to uh, comparatively speaking. So that gives you a, a, a better, like the stretch of the quadricep is extremely important when rehabilitating, when uh, doing uh, stretching, active, dynamic, static stretching, all the stretching stuff, the active, dynamic, you're going to get a lot of that next year for those, who, um, for those who move on. So the quadricep stretch is super important to allowing the function of the, the knee and the hip to move in the direction it needs to move in, in order to allow the athlete to perform its particular motion. So we're going to get into you stretching, right? So when we get it, this will be next week. You'll do it on a partner, right? Just like you did before. Um, and you're going to perform this particular stretch, right? On your particular partner. So this is, you're going to put the leg in, in hip extension and knee flexion if they are uh, flexible enough. Some people are not flexible enough to perform that stretch like so. And I'll cover that in a little bit in terms of the differences in, in stretches and flexibility and so forth. So here's the next one. So here we, this is image, this is still image two, right, on the left. So image two is on the left. Now image three is on the right. So comparison, less degrees, hip extension in image two, right? So basically if we go back to the flexion and the extension definition, Hip extension was an increase in angle at the joint. Hip uh, or extension was. Flexion is a decrease in angle at the joint. So image two, it gives us more hip flexion, less hip extension. So what that's doing is basically if we don't go with the degrees, we just go with basically the flexion and extension definition, we know that there's less uh, extension. So basically, if we look here on this, there's, there's basically less extension and more flexion on the right side, which means it's a smaller angle, right? The angle has closed. So if we look at the angles here, much more, oops, sorry. It's a much more open angle, more, more degrees. Much more open, well, I'm gonna even stay away from the word degrees so it's not confusing. There's a more of an angle here. Here, hip flexion, there's less of an angle. So if we look at this, the two blue lines, the blue lines intersect. The blue lines, we'll do this one. This blue line here shows the axis, right? We go back to different um, classes, right, um, with regards to even, I think maybe even physics has it, math, right, axes and all that. Here it is, right? We won't work with axes or axes, I think that's how you say it, in class drawing. It might be something I start to do because I, I really like the way this, this diagrams work out. But we would just work on goniometer, work with goniometers, inclinometers, measuring tools. We just get exact degrees, period. So if we take this, this, axis. This is the axis in line with the femur, right? And it travels all the way up. Then we take this axis. This is in line with the torso, right? So we take axis of the femur, axis of the torso, and we find the degree. Now, <coughs> this picture on the, on the right, you can see it's a much closer axis, right? So the angle is much smaller. It's a closed degree of flex uh, a, or a closed uh, angle more so than the image one. So hip flexion is still occurring here. Now, going from image two to image three, which will break down the knee in a little bit, there's not a lot of knee difference. It's very subtle. So most of the work being done is at the hip. So 
uh, the quadricep muscle, it creates hip flexion. Okay, it, so it's creating the hip flexion. It's not the hamstring, right? The hamstring does knee flexion and hip extension. The hamstring basically brings it posterior. The quadricep is going to bring it anterior. So the quadricep creates hip flexion to bring the foot closer to the ball to assist the striking or to assist in striking. The quadricep length of muscle is shorter as the upper leg is brought toward the ball to strike. So if we did an eyeball test again, it's probably more difficult to see, right? Um, because of the fact that there's some hip flexion, but it's not a lot, right? So we look at this angle, it's probably 20 degrees. This angle is probably like five, maybe 10, probably closer to be maybe between five and 10. So it's not a lot. Um, so you're not going to see a whole big, a huge difference in the, in the distance between the insertion and origin, but just know that the origin or the insertion is still a little closer to the origin on the image to the right because the muscle has shortened. Uh, and, the, and the hamstring, we say it must be ready to lengthen, right? So the hamstring, again, in, in neon purple, it's not all the way lengthening yet, right? Because it's actually still contracting. It's doing a lot of work. It's, con it's, still, con it's still contracting that um, – it's still contracting the, the hamstring and, and approximating the insertion to the origin. It hasn't lengthened yet, the, but it's starting to. You can kind of see the angle is a little bit different at the knee, but the quadriceps still doing a lot of work, but so is the hamstring, right? The hamstring's doing a lot of work and the quadriceps doing some work. So they have to be really in sync to allow the muscles to do what they need to do at different hips or different joints. So here's a picture of the knee, right? And a, a, or a, I should say uh, breaking down the knee. And I said um, basically before that the knee is uh, getting closer to the ball based on the hip flexing and not the knee moving so much, but more of the hip. So we compare. So slightly, there's more degree, uh, degrees of knee extension in image two. Um, so what that means basically is that, again, getting away from the degrees. So uh, in image two, there's a little bit more knee extension, right? So the angle is opened, is opened up more. Um, so the, the, Image in, uh, the knee in image two, the angles open up more. Not a lot. It's not a lot. And the knee on image one is closed up just a little bit. So image one has more flexion. Image two has a little bit more extension. So let me say that similar. So uh, image one has uh, more flexion and image two has less flexion, right? So more flexion in image one, less flexion image two, which means the, uh, one, the picture on image two is moving into knee extension in order to open up the leg. Now, if we go to, so the quadricep again is most of the work here is performed to create more hip flexion. Not a lot of knee extension going on here. It's still more hip flexion than anything. And uh, leg flexion, right? Lower leg flexion is still occurring a lot, but there's a lot of hip flexion going on as well. So, the hip flexion has brought the foot and knee closer to the ball to prepare for the strike. So th that's basically what has occurred here. And so when we look at the, the, um, the bars, yellow and the orange bars that are showing you from image one, the bar, the yellow bar is much, lo much longer compared to the yellow bar on image two that's connecting the knee to the ball. And then the orange bar on image one is – much longer than the, than the orange bar on image two, right? Which means that that foot is approximating or working to get closer to the ball in order to strike it effectively. Now, um, if we, even if we do an eyeball test, I put, these are down here just to compare the difference, but I don't, I think you can see it very clearly if you do an eyeball test in terms of um, the differences between the knee and the ball and the foot and the ball on image one to the left and image two on the right. So again, it's very, very important to understand that that, that uh, uh, those muscles, the quadricep, are really uh, it's super important here to allowing there to be enough hip flexion and then begin to initiate knee extension in order to get 
the foot toward the ball to strike. So here's uh, another uh, viewpoint, okay? So of, of, uh, of stretching and then of the motion. So before it was a bit more hip extension and a little bit more knee flexion, and now it's less, right? So now, now we have, this is very similar, right? So now we have almost 90 degrees of, of knee flexion um, and so it's very similar, the picture on the right of the person being stretched and then the athlete. Okay, so again, going back to it, it's very important to be able to understand that the quadricep stretch is very important to ensure that the athlete has full flexibility, or as much flexibility as possible to be able to get through the motion. Now, soccer players in general, if you, if you were to test um, 100 soccer players, and I don't have the exact data here, but if you were to test 100 soccer players and you say, okay, I want, we're going to test 100 soccer players' quad flexibility. So we're basically going to just do them do to the right and we're going to stretch, stretch them out. Uh, what you would see is you would see that majority of the soccer players' quad flexibility is really, really good. And so um, going back to this image here, Again, I rotate the, the athletes down, wrote, take a few copies, rotate it down, see if she was lying on her stomach like the individual was lying on his stomach or her stomach. It would be a very, very similar angle in terms of the way that the, the motion is. So we compare it. Um, I would say if you took 100 soccer players, 90% of them would have the flexibility on the right side of their strike leg, okay? 90%, so it might even be more. 90% of those athletes would have extremely great flexibility of their strike leg, and it would look very similar to the right side, even more. They may even be able to get their foot all the way to their glute. Now, other athletes, all right, football in particular, football players in particular, you test their hamsh or you test their quadricep flexibility, and on the left picture is what you're going to get. Maybe a little bit more, but the major you take the same thing. 90% of football players, I'm going to say over the span of 15 years, I've been doing flexibility testing and stretching football players. I'm going to say 90% are going to have very little, very slight, small, uh, poor flexibility on their quadricep. Um, primarily, Right? Soccer players, especially those with the strike leg, they're constantly striking the ball. And they have to perform that motion all the time. Now, what will happen is you'll find what is the most common uh, a strain of which muscle in soccer players? Is it quads or is it hamstrings? 90% of players, and I don't have data, but I would say over time, 15 years of me working with athletes, uh, primarily soccer players, Hamstring strains are more, much more common in soccer players than quad strains, and you see why, right? They're constantly uh, having to perform ex hip extension and constant knee flexion in order to cock the ball. And once they strike the ball, they don't have to go into complete hip flexion and, and with knee extension. It, and I'll show, it, I'll show what that means here in just a little bit on how that works. So here's your difference, right? Um, still, uh, the images to the left, this is a certain phase of the, of the strike phase, certain aspect or part of the strike phase of the ball. And the same thing is uh, on image number right, uh, image to the right. It's another phase of the entire strike uh, phase of, of the striking of a, um, a soccer ball uh, with regards to uh, an athlete who's playing. So let's move on. Uh, unilateral right. Okay, so the hip, now she's at the point to where she's almost got the capabilities. She's almost there, right? She she's, has her leg uh, hip extended initially on the first one, knee extended. Then she cocked her, she flexed her knee in order to strike the ball. And then now she's coming back through in order to get a strike on the ball that's effective. So where are we at now? So now we're at hip is out of extension, right? It's, it's 
almost neutral. It's out of full. It's out of more extension. Not necessarily out of extension all the way, but it, it, it actually it looks pretty neutral. So if we were to do some measurements, which I have on the next one, you'll see it, it's pretty neutral. So it is. We'll say it's out of extension, and then the knee is slight flexion. So the knee is now actually um, not as much flexed as it was before. So now the hamstring is not doing as much work, right? So the hamstring usually in the, the past, right, with the previous motions where you have knee flexion, that foot is, co is, close to the, is close to that glute. It's not there anymore. So the hamstring has now begun to relax. And the quadricep is still doing a lot of work, right? Because the quadricep has to, hip, has to flex the hip and now and it has to extend the knee. So even though the hip is not completely flexed and it's actually more neutral, now what has to happen is that quadricep continues to have to extend the knee in order to strike the ball. So now we get more into knee extension, but that quadricep's really active. So the hamstring insertion is now further away from the origin and the quadricep insertion now is closer to the origin. All right, so the, the quadricep is now shortening and the, and the hamstring is beginning to lengthen. So here we go. And I, I know I, I mentioned, I'll, I'll, I've already talked about a little bit, but so comparison, hamstring. Now the longer length is an image two of the hamstring, right? So if we did, again, eyeball test, and again, I have these, let's just do it real quick. So if I move, if I grab this, and I put this, this comes from here, okay? It comes from image two, boom. And I put it on image one. And I'm not going to rotate it because then it could change the length. But I put on image one. And I pull it off. You can see, now we eyeball test that. That's going to be longer, right? It's going to be a longer muscle based on the fact that it's now having to lengthen the heel right? Or the foot is now much further away in order to extend and strike the ball than it was here. So the hamstring is no longer flexing the leg, approximating the insertion to the origin. It's now lengthening. So this particular muscle is going to be longer. And then the quadricep is not, is, is, it's beginning to come out of extension or out of flexion, the, the knee is beginning to come out of flexion and it's more extension. Mm, and we'll do an angle, uh, you know, comparison later on. Um, but the, if we changed it, this again comes from here. It's not going to, whoops, it's not going to be a lot. It's not going to be a lot. So this is here, but if we changed it, it's going to, it'll, it would be a little bit of a difference, right? So we can see, and I'm not going to rotate it again, but we can see it's going to be slightly, slightly different than the, um, it's going to be longer, right? So the quadricep, this picture here, the quadricep, it's going to be a longer muscle still, um, I'm sorry, it's going to be longer on the left side. The, as it goes to the right, uh, the muscle on the right is going to begin to shorten. But it's not a big difference, so it's very difficult to see. So let me go, let me go back, and I just wanted to give you an idea and the way that, why those, are, those images are there so that you can see I had a reason for it. Um, okay, so... So the hamstring must now begin to lengthen, as we said before. So it's, it's, much, it's, it's longer here as the insertion leaves uh, or pulls further away from the origin because that quadricep muscle is now pulling, right? This muscle here is now pulling that tibial tuberosity just exactly like the tibialis anterior pulls up on that first, uh, uh, first, and sec or first metacarpal and first cuneiform to pull that dorsiflex that foot. Same difference, right? So that quadricep is now pulling up on that tibial tuberosity to allow extension to occur. Um, the quadricep is now acting on both the hip and the knee, flexing the hip and extending the knee. Now there's more knee extension. And the quadricep is slightly shorter in length. 
uh, in image two, but not like I said before, but not by much. So you, it's really difficult to do an eyeball test here. And you know, even with the testing I did earlier um, in terms of showing you what those lines are for, it's even difficult to really show it on that. But at least I wanted to give you a viewpoint of that. Okay, so now here's the knee. Okay, so comparison. Hamstring's longer in length in image two. There's more knee flexion in image one, right? So more knee flexion in image one. Remember, the flexion is a decrease in angle at the joint, more extension in image two, extension, an increase in angle at a joint. Um, the quadriceps slightly shorter length in image two, not by much, right? More knee extension in image two. So image two, more knee extension, more image one, more knee flexion. Uh, the hamstring, again, must now begin to lengthen. It has to lengthen in order for that quadricep to be allowed to do its job. Uh, the quadricep is now acting on both hip and knee, flexing the hip and extending the knee. And there's much more knee extension now on the right side compared to the left. Again, left side, much more knee flexion. Right side, less knee flexion, more knee extension. Um, and again, we use the blue lines, right? The blue axis. Here's the femur. Here's the tibia. We cross them. We have our angle. Here's the uh, tibia. There's the femur axis. We cross them. We have our angle. Um, so, again, it's very important to understand that we have this motion. She's getting to the point where she's striking the ball, but she's not there yet, right? She's about to. So, here we go. Now she's just hit the ball, right? It's, she struck it. The ball's come off her foot. Um, so now we, and it's a different motion. It's a different position. Here we have, I'll compare it there. Um, so unilateral right hip flexion, knee extension, right? So she's, she's now in hip flexion. She actually is. And I'll, we'll do a comparison a little bit later. And now she has almost, almost full knee extension. It's not quite yet. When we do the axis and the lines in a little bit, I'll show you what that looks like. But the hamstring insertion is now further away from the origin. And the quadricep insertion is now closer to the origin. So again, in hamstring insertion now further away from the origin. Remember, the insertion point of the hamstring, tibia and the fibula, right? Um, medial condyle of the tibia, medial surface of the tibia, pes anserine, and then the fibula for the biceps. And the insertion, now closer to the origin. So the insertion of the quadricep, the tibial tuberosity is now closer to the origin. So here we go, comparison, hamstring. Longer length in image two. Uh, okay, so it's longer, it has to be, right? So that, that, that muscle, that hamstring must now lengthen and be able to stretch. It has to be able to almost fully stretch, which is, this is, they're not, She's not quite at a full stretch here for the hamstring, but it's close. And then the quadriceps shorter length in image two, right? It's a shorter length in image two. You can't really eyeball it. It looks a little bit different. If we did the comparison again, we would see that the, the quadricep is a shorter length in image two compared to the, the, the green image one. Um, and then the quadriceps now still acting on both hip and the knee. It's still doing that. Flex the hip and extending uh, the knee even more. So here's the, the differences in the angles. So the hamstring has a longer length in image two. It must lengthen, as I said earlier. It has to. There's no way to get around it. If it doesn't lengthen, then that muscle's not going to, the quadricep is not going to be able to have enough power and strike another ball as we'd like. The quadricep shorter length in image two, more knee extension in number two. So the quadricep again, has a shorter length in image two, there's more knee extension. The knee is almost in full extension, okay, almost, and the hip continues to move into flexion. So let's, let's break down uh, the angles here. So here we have, here's, here's your axis for the femur, here's your axis for the tibia, and then you have your angle at the knee, right? So again, going back to the flexion extension definitions, we stay away from the degrees just to make it simple. Right? There is more flexion here than knee still. That quad still having to keep that leg in flexion just a bit, a bit. But as it swipes through the ball in image two, that quadricep has done more work. The hamstring has to lengthen. 
and the quadricep then performs enough mo enough work in order to extend the knee to in order to allow her to strike the ball. So here's prior pre-strike, here's post-strike. Pre-strike, slight flexion of the knee, the hip, uh, not a lot of difference, right? I mean, there's a little bit of difference at the hip. You can see, here's the angle. Again, axis, red axis torso. This is the axis of the femur. But there's not a big difference here, right? I mean, if, any, if anything, it's, it's minimal. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the quadricep is still not doing work to flex the hip. Um, I mean, it, it's, there's still a little bit. There's a little bit of hip flexion there now compared to before where there was no hip flexion and it was full hip extension. So now, again, going back to it, there's a decrease in angle at the joint with regards to the hip. So both, are, both things are occurring. There's hip flexion and then there is um, knee extension. So hip flexion and knee extension in order to get her to strike the ball and, and, uh, uh, correctly. So again, pre-strike, post-strike. Knee flexion, almost full knee extension, right? So it's, it's changed quite a bit. So you, now here, she struck it. She's still in her follow through now, right? So you have the unilateral right, hip flexion. Now she's in full knee extension. Muscles, hamstring, the insertion is now further, furthest away from the origin, and the quadricep insertion is now closer to the origin. Okay, again, insertion, now furthest away, because that, that hamstring is on full stretch now. So it doesn't have to be a, um, a the, the, the insertion are not approximated to the origin like they were in the first couple images where she was having full knee flexion. And the quadricep insertion now is closer to its origin. Okay, so comparison, not a big change from image two in terms of length of muscles due to knee movement being so minimal from image one and image two. So not a big difference, right? So I don't, yeah, I, I did the comparison there too, I think, the knee. Um, not a big difference for image one and image two with the knee. Um, and the hamstring must now lengthen to be able to stretch. So it has to be on a full, it has to be on a full lengthening uh, motion in order to allow the quadricep to do its job. The quadriceps now acting on both the hip and the knee, still flexing the hip and extending the knee even more. So here's, uh, let's see, I think I threw off this image here. We'll just try to work with it. Um, so here's the hip. So comparison. So there's not much, the knee is not much difference in an angle. Okay. So let's just do this since I'm on a different slide. So the knee's not much difference in a, of, of, an, of an angle and there's more flexion of the hip. Okay. So um, now the hamstring now must lengthen, be able to stretch maximally. The quadricep has worked maximally to fully extend the knee and continues to flex the hip for power. Right, so here we have full knee, ex not, not full knee extension yet here, but here we have full knee extension, or full, sorry, a lot of hip flexion and full knee extension. And so let me go back to the slide in this particular situation. So let's go, I'm gonna have you go to this right side right here with the follow through. So here's the, the hip in full, in, in a lot of flexion. And again, here, after she uh, strikes it, uh, it's, let me, let me go back. It's not as much hip flexion. And now it's more hip flexion to the right. And then we have hip extension, right? But now we look at, which there's still a little, there's still, or sorry, knee extension. She's extending the knee. There's still a little bit of, uh, of angle here we can see, but now with her follow through here on the right, there's absolutely no uh, change, right? So the purple indicates the, uh, the tibia and then the femur indicates, or the blue indicates the, the femur. So blue femur, 
purple tibia. Um, and so there's very, very, very little uh, change there. So it, she's fully extended there with regards to that knee. So the, the hamstring now must lengthen to be able to stretch maximally. And the quadricep has worked to fully extend the knee and continues to, to flex the hip to power through. So if we look at it now, there's to the right, there's quite a bit of a hip flexion here. Whereas here in the previous, uh, previous image, there's not, a, as, there's not as much. So here it's, it's changed quite a bit from hip flexion. So let's move on to, to here. So we go to the hamstring stretch. Now what we did is we rotated the, we rotated the images just like I did previously. We just put her on her back, right? Like as if she's on her back, we know she's not. And it's very similar, right? So here's a pretty good uh, picture of the hamstring stretch. This is like 90 degrees. She's not at 90 degrees, right? Um, but she's, she would be getting there. So not, not, not 90, I mean 90, not 90, right? So um, with regards to uh, the flexibility and, uh, you know, it's very important to understand that soccer athletes in general do not have good hamstring flexibility. So what we need to do is we need to be able to stretch them out uh, very well and ensure that they're doing proper hamstring stretches, dynamic, active, et cetera, in order to allow the, uh, the hamstring to be flexible because um, hamstring flexibility will limit an athlete's ability to strike a ball and do things. And we, and again, soccer players have a higher tendency of developing hamstring, uh, hamstring um, strains than, uh, than uh, quadriceps strains. Okay, so that in terms of right now is, is all I have, but um, are, there any, are there any questions before I pull off? 